uh, August 1st meeting with Parks Advisory Board uh, roll call. Richard Heisey. Here. Bennett Aiken. Oh, we see you. Can you hear us? Are you talking about me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't hear your voice till I was but I was still in the process of joining. Okay. Here. Donya and Lance. Peter Argentine here. Rob Mackey here. Kelly O'Grodnick. Not there again. Tom Shepchuk. Here. Uh, Commissioner Flynn. Hello. Public Works Director Rudy Simple here. Staff liaison Phil Olio. I'm present. Hello, Miss Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hello. Kelly O'Grodnick. We we have eight months. Do we um you know, until this ends? Are we gonna get an intern or a, not an intern? Sorry, a junior board member. I, I would like to have an intern. <laughs> <laughs> an intern would be helpful. Um the junior board, I, I can ask. I don't know. Well, yeah. Our board's still doing that. If so, is anyone interested? Does anyone know anyone that's interested? Well, in the past, it was the commissioner who liaison, who, I mean, who appointed it. But I can make an inquiry. If you no, want no, no. I, I can take care of it. Um, no, no. We we do it through a coordinated process. Um, I just not sure kind of where it stands this year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a quorum. Citizens' comments. Angie or Sandy, do you have anything? Are you hanging out for? Uh, for the presentation. I guess I should allow you to answer if I'm gonna ask you something. Yeah, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, now just hanging out for comment or for, for the presentation. Cool. Me as well. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Approval of June minutes. Thank you. Second. Aye. 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 Thanks, Phil. All right. Uh, hi, Tim. Can you hear us? Yes. Excellent. So, Tim Nettle <laughs> of Oikos uh, for our Invasives Management Study update, please. Okay, I'm on? Yes, sir. You're on. All right, great. Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to talk to you and give you an update. I'm hoping I can share a screen. One moment. Maybe. I mean, if you're a panelist. Yeah, he's a panelist, so he should be able to share. Okay, so just anytime I'm ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's... Okay. Are you seeing a map of Bird Park? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, the first thing we did, um, just, this is kind of a, just a status update. Um, some of this has been shared before, um, not at a meeting, but um, to uh, the staff who may have also shared it with the with the advisory board. Um, so we received some data for, from each park from the township, and we created a, a web application, GIS web application that displays that. And um, to this, we've been adding data that uh, we've collected. So um, the first thing we did was collected data on invasive species in each park. And uh, these each... My computer is being very slow today, <laughs> so um, I apologize for delays. Basically, what this data is showing as of this spring, early summer, what the assessment of invasive species were, uh, focusing on the shrubs. Um, there are some herbaceous species that were not evident at the time. For example, garlic mustard was, was not very evident at that time, so that's just something to keep in mind. This is not a com comprehensive inventory. It's mainly geared towards um, the shrubs. So you can click in, in these uh, polygons. They're color-coded by herbaceous versus trees versus, versus um, 
shrubs and being the primary thing. And you can see down here, there's a pop-up that says it's amber honeysuckle and Chinese privet. Uh, whereas this polygon over here that's red would be herbaceous. And that is a garlic mustard with uh, with cut honeysuckle patches. So did yeah, I did say garlic mustard wasn't that evident. It was starting to come up. Um, and um, things like this is trees. These are, if I remember correctly, Norway maples, not Naples, um, Norway uh, spruces, um, which not invasive, but they're not native. So they got mapped that way. So that's the case. We did that for each of the parks. And um, subsequently, we also assessed uh, tree trees in plots to get an idea of what the canopy composition was. So these are, we use a method, it's called a variable radius plot, or uh, some people call it plotless, because what it is is you, you, you establish a point. These are um, quasi-systematically placed throughout the park, uh, eight to 10 within each of the three conservation parks, Bird, Rob Hollow, and Twin Hills. And uh, if I zoom into one of these, It um, these are samples, right? So there's there's eight to ten per plot, and we get a comprehensive, or a, I should say, a composite idea of what the canopy, uh, forest canopy, is in each plot. So these, if you clicked on each of these dots, and I shared with Phil just before the the meeting, Phil and Rudy, uh, links to this, so you can look at this uh, um, at your convenience um, to kind of click around and poke. So this is a should be a black locust, uh, 12, 22 inches diameter. Uh, the the blue are black cherry. You can open up a legend also over here to the side. Um, this little button here, this, this shows a this little thing that looks like uh, here it looks like arrows, but when it's collapsed, it looks like a chevron or a stack of layers. And then this thing that looks like a bulleted list sort of is the uh, is the legend. So you can look at those are the species of trees and the plots, this their sizes and uh, other layers that are displayed, um, invasive species, um, et cetera. Uh, invasive, these are the invasive uh, trees, shrubs and racious that are being displayed right now. Um, so some other data that we receive, let's see, da, 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 uh, we received some information from the par parks, some parks advisory board members on previous management activities that had happened in the park that, that mostly done through uh, the advisory committee or the, the nature conservancy. And we digitize those here with an idea of starting with the data that you've already collected, Starting with that, providing a tool for ongoing updates. So say um, next year, there's uh, an activity to uh, remove some invasive species. You can go in and edit or add a polygon and make notes as to what you guys did. Uh, and that way you can kind of keep a running record of, all, of the activities that doesn't rely so much on the institutional memory of your staff and volunteers. Um, I did want to ask a question of um, this big area that's hatched here. There was some some comments that I received that were clear something was done, like we added it, goat clearing was done here, removal and planting was done here, riparian restoration is an activity over here. But some of these just had lists of species. Um, so here there was a lot of things. Knotweed, bittersweet, privet, still grass, tree of heaven, honeysuckle, burning bush, jet bead, and double by burnum, double file by burnum. Um, but it wasn't clear whether that was an inventory or whether there was an activity associated with that. So does anybody know the answer to that question? I'm doing that. The so pretty much like I just the the zone from the far uh the left hand side of your screen through yeah. to um 
you know, where that, that, that you've got that patch that's marked um, reforestation and planting. Yeah, uh, riparian. Zone, I have hand inspected. There is nothing left invasive in that zone as of last weekend. Okay. So that we've done with those, all the species that were removed. So, so it was done in, right. I, you know, it was so, a consultant of an invasive expert and over three, four years, we went through species by species, removing um, different invasives. I mean, there's still sm small plants and things, but effectively sure. there's nothing over, you know, there's, there's things you always miss, but anything probably over 12 inches tall has been, been removed. Okay. I kind of thought so, because if you compare what was done, which is the highlighted uh, box now with these blue square boxes that and and red ones that we uh, collected. There's a lot less. Yeah, it's, it's so, the project's yeah. moving <laughs> from the west to the east. So the the two thirds to the west has had three passes over four years. Okay, where the projects more to the east of that, they're just on their second pass. Okay. So but that if removal we... and planting that was that was a complete mature grove of the honeysuckles. Um, uh -huh. Some of them were sixty years old. That along the hillside there, there was honeysuckles planted for erosion control in the late oh, late early seventies. And that's that's and there was also on the other end of the park some planted, and they've been the source of the honeysuckles. So I actually did some work on measuring density and age of honeysuckles. And they basically were radiating out from that zone. As I as, as I removed closer and closer to that, the age increased, and I, I even calculated the rate of uh, movement, how far, how fast it was spreading per five years. But the, the oldest ones were right on the hill, and I think I counted sixty-two rates. There was there were 62, 63 years old. Okay. That's why there's nothing right. left. That was a complete nothing but honeysuckle and grapevine. It's the only thing living in that circle. Uh, a few trees, but it was completely infested. Okay. Can we assume that any of these notes, were you one of the ones who gave me a markup, a map markup? No, I wasn't asked to. <clears throat> okay. I offered, but no one took me up on it. Uh, okay, there's a, there's a few other areas like this one that are the similarly colored. That uh, is it safe to assume that anything marked on those maps? Who provided the maps? Anyone there? And, and you're a teeny tiny little square on my screen, so <laughs> I can't so, see. Well, I, I coordinate with an acre conservancy and Ron Block. Ron pretty much he he is probably the best source overall for what's been done historically. So I communicate a lot with Ron and say, okay, Ron, I'm doing it. And I said, what do you think needs done next? And, and I'm kind of working with him. So if Ron Bach provided you information, that's probably the best source there is. Uh, and Tom. Um... Yeah, I, I sent you, uh, Tim, some maps marked up based on memory. Right. So they're somewhat suspect. Um, you know, work going back to like 2012, 2015, 2016. Um, and the work was by no means, you know, gotten in any of the locations or just areas that I knew we had as the conservancy had taken a whack at over the years. Yeah, so if you look like that, well, Ron explained to me like that parking lot, the, where the parking lot is, and then there's the slope below, so it's right to the right of the school in your picture. The first work on that started in 2012. And then we did a major push again, and there have been successive waves, and there was a major push last summer to clear that and, and do some planting. So, so it's been, been, there's probably three or four waves of work on that hill. Okay, so can, can we assume that any, anything noted on those maps were, were not just inventories, they were, if it says knotweed, for example, you removed the knotweed, you just yeah. didn't. Oh, yes, that's not we was removed. Like, Phil, we have sprayers that work for the city. And so we have an invasive budget. So, like, the uh, Eichenlaub did a fair amount of spraying for not weed in Bird Park over the years. Okay, great. So that's I sent you, Jim, where I indicated I'm going from memory what I sent you a month or so ago. Yeah. If I go circled and said not weed or honeysuckle or what have you. Excuse me, that's largely what we were taking out. 
Got it. The area yep. marked, which alas doesn't mean that there ain't any left. I mean, there's probably still some left or grow back. But then this right. map, this map looks pretty good. I mean, if you like, for at least what I know, where areas that have been worked deeply, you know, this this map looks pretty good. Okay. Like, yeah, I thought the that the project I, was just in the last year, and then the 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 work just to the south of that, there was a big push to con so to connect what had been done in the past to the west with the riparian project. There was a push to clear that area and get them connected last year. Okay, um, I figured that they were they were indicating you'd remove them, but um, my technician kind of categorized them as the ones that clearly said an activity like removal and planting. She kind of made those a different class than the than the ones that didn't explicitly say that there was an activity. But I thought that's what you meant. So we'll make sure it's clear in the mapping that that's this is an, the record of activity that has been done, not just inventories of things. Um, okay, uh, so another, at the last meeting, um, we talked about, we, I had a, had a, there was a gathering of Parks Advisory Board members, and I got some input. We were talking about the types of, some types of additional information that might be really useful to have. So, um, let's say I'm going to shut some things off here. The one, the one comment I made about Bird Park that's helpful is oh. if you start on the west end at the lower lot, you can now walk through in a zone that's completely cleared, restored, it's had some time to recover. Then in the middle part, you hit areas that have been recently worked and are kind of in progress. And then when you get to the far side of the soccer field, there's a few patches, but then there, there's purely infested areas. So it lets a person right. compare contrast about what is a fully restored zone look like on the far west end versus a completely in you know invaded area on the far east end? Yeah, yeah. There's quite a difference in Bird Park. Yeah. Um, what you can notice over here, you know, notice there's basically black cherry and black locust over in the these areas. So um, not a lot of tree diversity uh, in those plots. Um, we talked about at the meeting. Maybe there'd be a way to collect some data, maybe using LIDAR data to get an idea more broadly of areas that had dense canopy cover versus areas that did not. Um, and those areas that were more sparse could be areas that would need uh, treatment for invasive understories. It could, it could highlight some of the areas that would uh, be more likely to have invasive understories because of the lack of canopy. So... Uh, what we did is uh, we flew a drone, which is should be showing up here. And this is um, flown uh, with a drone. It also had a multi-spectral camera on it, which we're playing with seeing if we get useful data on there. Sometimes you can use that to get indicate we're, what we're trying to do is see if we can start identifying tree species from the imagery which would be super cool so you could say what's this tree species right here and you could say that well according to the to the analysis it says it's a you know sugar maple um so we're, we're testing that out kind of as a little extra thing that we're curious about um but uh maybe we'll be able to get you that information maybe not um, we'll see how far we get, but we definitely at this time have have um, relative composition of the, of each park by species from these forestry plots. This is kind of like the old fashioned way to do it, right? You go out there and measure them, and you make an inference about an area based on a sample. Um, and we're going to use these point data to see, okay, well, we know what was at this location. We know that was black locust right there, and that was black cherry, and that was something else. Um, can we match those up to the canopies that are visible from the aerial imagery? And can we classify these? You can tell visibly there's these light green things and there's these dark green things. Um, it's pretty obvious that the light green things are black locust. Um, and some of the, some of the things you can actually see the leaf texture and you can tell that it's black walnut, which is kind of fun to look at and geek out about. Um, but one of the things we could do to, 
so far quantitatively is um, we could subtract the, so we used the, the primary reason to, to fly the imagery was, was to get tree heights. So should be loading right now are, is a map of tree heights. So there you go. So the, the darker green colors are taller than the lighter green colors. So that is the height above ground. Well, it's the elevation of the, of the canopy minus the elevation of the ground. So it gives you height above ground. So these areas that are light green would be areas that don't have uh, tree canopies. One suggestion, I don't know if that would fit within your time frame, but there's usually about a three week period where the native species have dropped their leaves, but the Asian species keep them. And I've seen an aerial yeah. picture of the park <laughs> taken at that time, and it really lets you zero in. You can see where the dense, um, invasive group or plants are versus, but you got to hit the window just right where right. The, the leaves have dropped on the native trees, but the invasive still has their leaves. But there's usually about a three week period that you can you can see, and then the canopy's gone, the native canopy's gone, and and the invasive density shows up like a sore thumb. Yeah, we did that kind of at, at a ground level. That's when we timed our inventory in the uh, in the spring of the invasive shrubs. So, so they would be really easy to, to, to see. Um, so that's what that data that I showed you earlier, that was a ground-based survey. Um, but um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And that's something, one of the things that we hope to test uh, is, is, you know, people, you know, like you said, we know this because we observe it in nature. Can we start using aerial uh, imagery data like this, but uh, flown at the correct time to, better be able to quantify it. So we didn't do that within the context of this project yet, but um, we might be able to, to uh, do another flight later in the season. The reverse is also true. Like, so you said in the fall that the Asian species keep their leaves longer. The reverse is true in the spring. They, they leaf out earlier. Yeah. Can you zoom out? Yeah. So from this, Tim, can you infer what species the lighter are uh, versus the darker, or are we looking at this is where trees exist versus not? Is it these are heights, right? These these, are heights. This is heights, right? So uh, individual tree species would be a separate analysis. So that would be using a combination. I'm going to turn off the heights for a second. So we can see underneath. Um, let me see. I'll turn off the. In this part, it'd be hard to, because there's been restoration, it's hard to know what the lower level height stuff is. In Twin Hills, the lower level height stuff is all uh, probably honeysuckle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here it is. There's a lot over here too, right? <laughs> so I would imagine like these, if we just turn on and turn off real quick. So let's say we're looking at this area here that's bright green. Um, let's turn on the tree heights real quick. It's it's short bright green stuff, right? Filled with second growth hardwoods and the east end filled with first growth volunteer trees. And boy, can you see the difference in the colors? Tree canopy. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear what that comment was. The, the west end of the park has lots of second growth hardwoods and mature hardwoods. Yeah. The east end has where volunteer trees, like you said, cherries and, and locusts, and things like that. And I'm just looking at the color difference. The, the one, the one looks more like a sea green and the other side looks more of a forest green. There's definitely a difference in the, the right. green color of the canopy on the two right. halves. Of the yeah, that's where I was going. This really dark or probably, you know, 125 foot tall beaches and oak yeah. trees. But even the regular color, when you had that one color picture up, I was kind of surprised at how different the, the, the colors in the different sides. Yeah, if we if we take off the, the heights again, um, so, okay, so you can see a lot of different variability over here. 
you start to get the right okay, on the left side on the, on the west side you see lots of things that's all locust yeah uh, all right yeah so these these quiet. sort of like blue green leaves okay. those are black locust yep and um you know some of them you can you can actually i'm actually not i don't know how good quality this photo is uh when it's imported into the GIS, I'll just let it sit there a second uh, to re-render. -re yeah, so you can see this is very good quality photography. And um, some of these trees you can actually see, you get, get, get a sense that the black locust, I mean, you can, or the black walnut, you can see the compound leaves. They look like more feathery. The canopies look more feathery. Uh, the black um, locust or have that light blue color. So those are some things with some additional data and analysis. We're just going to test out, can we actually use that data to make a hypothesis about, well, this tree that we didn't, we didn't collect a point under is a black maple or a black locust. There's a lot of black uh, named trees out, out there. Black locust, black locust, black cherry, black walnuts, black maple. Um, and uh, anyway, um, and then we can go out and ground truth. Well, how how good did it do? The the data said that this should be a sugar maple. Is it a sugar maple? Um, so that's something we we're planning on doing in the near future analytically. Uh, we can just look at some of these other parks real quick. So here's Rob Hollow over here. We may refly Rob Hollow just because the the pilot kind of didn't get the shape of the outline right. There's a chunk of Rob Hollow right here that was missed. Um, so I mean, there's not a lot of trees over there, but there's a few. Uh, so, so same kind of data. I think the thing is interesting about this is you get to kind of see the the difference in tree composition between the different parks and the different areas. So up here we have some white pines. Uh, over here we kind of have some more oaks and and um, forget what some of these these uh, like, like these light blue species are. Let's see, black cherries, American elms, um, other blue things. So those are interesting. Uh, Twin Hills is an interesting case also, I think. Um, and it's an area where I, I had in my head about using this method of tree heights to kind of target where some additional management may be focused. So off the bat, you know, the first thing I notice is not a lot of tree diversity here. We have this dark blue and this light yellow in terms of our inventory, and those are black cherry and black locust. Um, and the, the, there were, we had 10 uh, forestry plots in, in uh, Twin Hills. Uh, if we look at heights now, It really kind of pops out that there's a lot of sparse areas. That we didn't have as much information on the activity, the management activities that had been done in Twin Hills. I'm sort of trying to display that now. I think I'm asking my computer to do a lot, do a video presentation and display very rich GIS data over the web at the same time. Does this indicate that less at, or less management is happening at um, Twin Hills? Because there was really a lot of information about Bird Park. Like Bird Park's always gotten more focused than Twin Hills or Rob Hollow. Okay. Um, and it's probably in that order, Bird Park and Twin Hills and Rob 
of all in terms of do the western end of bird park yeah you know it's gotten a lot of not the western end of bird park's got a lot of attention going back to the 1980s I think. okay there's well you can really see what the makes. That in the 80s that are still there This is the data that we uh, derive the tree heights from, by the way, and the aerial imagery. So this is um, a mosaic of hundreds of photographs. And the really cool thing is you can view them in three dimensions. It takes a while to render the points. But essentially, you can spin around and look at different places and you can zoom right in and that doesn't look like much right now but just give it a minute it's like minecraft <laughs> So can you start seeing the individual tree canopies? Now it looks like broccoli. <laughs> it looks like broccoli. Good. It's supposed to look like broccoli. <laughs> um, so this is kind of just, just fun to play with. And I sent links for this too. Uh, if you have a faster computer, or you're not, you know, doing an online meeting at the same time. It's fun to zoom in and around. You can look kind of under the trees and and to see the different shapes of trees. You can see other features like you can see the mowing lines on the football field and um and the soccer, you know, soccer goals and and stuff like that. Um so and your different mouse buttons do different things. So uh, zooming in would be your wheel. Uh, your right, your left mouse button is just moving it back and forth, and your your right mouse button um, spins it in different directions. Well, that's kind of what I wanted to sh show you to update on the status. Um, our inventory is is essentially complete, other than some potential revisits to add more data. Um, We'll see if we can maybe do do a flight in the fall to um, pick up those those uh, late leafing invasives. I'm not entirely sure. We did rent this this uh, drone and use it on a couple projects, so that kind of depends on whether we have have it available uh, at the right time. Um, Civic Mapper was talking about buying buying it as this is kind of a test drive that we could throw in there with, with no additional cost, but um, this would kind of be just extras, you know, that we we may or may not be able to, to deliver depending on if things line up right, if that makes sense. What are the next steps? Next steps are to uh, compile the data. So instead of just a, a picture of, of tree heights, for example, we are going to next step is to, is to look at uh, quantification. Can we uh, actually give you a, a number of trees per per park per acre, that kind of thing? More quantitative information, um, which we should be able to also get from the tree height data. Uh, and then there'll be a report of the of the findings. Um, there's a step in there with um, some recommendations. And uh, that'll be sort of a, you know a management plan phase, and then an implementation phase. So at each phase, phase I'll go to you guys with my recommendations, see if those seem to fit in with what your expectations are and your abilities are. Uh, refine that, and then that kind of gets folded in with with the next phase, which would be an implementation plan. So are we back in the beginning when we submitted the proposal? We had a we had a schedule laid out in there that kind of got jumbled up due to due to timing of the start of the project. So I don't think we actually established a revised schedule, as I recall. 
Um, but in terms of getting the next the, uh, phase of recommendations to you guys, I would look at uh, probably mid-September and then probably looking at, at finishing up the project by the end of the year with sort of final deliverables. Are there any uh, initial recommendations that are uh, in draft form that uh, would be available for review or? We don't, I don't have anything written up yet. Okay. Will, it, will there be any sense of, you mentioned implementation, any sense of um, dollar amounts needed for such a thing? Yeah, that's part of the, um, the implementation plan. Okay. That kind of comes at the end. Thanks. Yeah, and for that, so getting some some of your bids that you've gotten from Eisler, not Eisler, Eichenlaub, and any other companies, just to know what those, you know, what those were actually were, uh, would be helpful. Understanding that they were in the past and things change, but it's good to get that to kind of truth up what your estimates are, what my estimates would be. And maybe I've done, I did some work two years ago on doing, um, depending upon the density of infestation, the number of hours per acre it takes to to clear. So if at some point you want to share that, or I could share that either with you, and then also replant. So I have some, again, it's amateur data, but um, yeah, man. this is from work I've done on various, both here and another state on um, man hours per acre relative to the density of infestation. It starts to go up exponentially as you get about, you know, about 40, 30, 40 percent invested. It actually doesn't go linear. It goes, it's not linear. It gets harder. Right. Uh, not putting the cart before the horse in terms of implementation plan, but just having been out in the parks, did you see anything that um, you thought, oh, I wonder if they're aware of this? That is like an urgent need for for this year meaning again not part of a your comprehensive plan but did you see anything that we should maybe attack this year yeah i mean i think that there's a lot of very knowledgeable people volunteering for the parks that have a lot of knowledge yourselves way more than i anticipated when when uh, i uh first bid on this project um so i don't think there were many oh my god you got to get on top of this now uh okay. things that you didn't really know about um hemlock seems to be i mean you guys know about hemlock right I've, I've seen some activities in the in the past though this is the year of hemlock um it's just gone crazy uh it seems like it's one of those things that's reached a tipping point poison hemlock i'm talking about not the you know the tree um and that might be something that you you know you might not have noticed that it's kind of reaching this phase of getting out of control in a lot of places that being said i there aren't a lot of areas where i saw a lot of it uh it, i saw some over in um so some of it was over here in Twin Hills, kind of in that area by Cavendish Place, and then there was some in um, in uh, Rob Hollow, kind of by the that that um, it was kind of a meadow that's to the south of the the maintenance facilities. Um, okay, that's exactly the type of thing I was thinking of. So okay, again, short of the comprehensive plan. We should probably mark our calendars for unlock control for next year. Thank yeah, you. so it's I have a good sense of where it is in Twin Hills. Good. I know Peter has seen it over at golf course, and I don't know where the Rob Hollow is. Oh, is the Rob Hollow on the new pocket? I really haven't seen much down there unless it's in that. I don't see it Twin Hills. Yeah, it's I know the golf along, course, along the. Um, the sports fields, the yeah, team more yeah. fields, um, right along the path where people actually walk. So. 
below the pool. Below the right. pool. Okay. At a loss. So Richard and, and others knowledgeable can remind us, but I'm trying to remember what the guidance is for getting rid of hemlock. I know it's nasty stuff. Do we dig it up or just spray it? Catch a lesson, right? You said biennial. So if you just cut it, All right, right, just right, cut yeah. it and walk away. Good. Yeah, that's what Tim told us it, before. Then it won't recede. Right. So the main thing is like like other biennials, just get them, get the flower. First phase, you know, first year, right. Before yeah, you can that, that um definitely is is the case. Uh you can also use a typical herbicide on it. Um like Roundup or um you know other kind of glyphosate. People tend to freak out about when you use the word Roundup. Um unnecessarily in my view. Uh it's way safer than a lot of other things uh people could be using. Um but uh, a great time to treat it is early spring because it's in kind of winter rosette form and nothing else is is green. So if you're going to use use uh, herbicide, it's a great time to do it because it's really just going to hit that. Uh, and it's also very easy to find at that stage and that that will prevent it from flowering. And then it's dead. That's the great thing about about hemlock, you know, it is biennial, like was was another person mentioned, and if you can can kill it be, um, before it flowers, then then it's dead. You know, it's dead. Even if you just killed the above ground part, it's dead. Uh, it can't it can't grow back. Um, I think if you if you sort of mowed it before it had gone to flower, I think it would regrow from from the uh, basil rosette. But if you uh, chop off that. The growing just above the just below the part where the leaves come out or if you spray it won't come back march is that the right time frame yeah march would be a good time yeah and that's a great also time to do another thing is have you guys ever done a pre-emergent herbicide treatment we do in beds for canada thistle and things like that that are yes yeah, so, so that's another thing consider in the um in the spring for stilt grass um is a pre-emergent herbicide application so you know it basically prevents it from germinating it's an annual so um prevents it from from um germinating so you don't get another round of uh, and you can eventually deplete the seed bank same thing if you had uh I didn't see a lot of mile a minute, which was great. I have it all over my place. It's a, it's a real battle, but um, that's another thing that you need to, if you do start seeing mile a minute, you have to get rid of it immediately. And you can hand pull that, uh, it hand pulls pretty easily. Um, and, uh, but then, it, you know, sometimes it will germinate over a long period of time. So you, you know, you kind of have to go back and get it. So that would be just something to be on your guard, start looking for mile a minute, um, and get rid of it as soon as you can. There is some. There is some in Burke Park along Main Care. Unless we did, we I know we worked on it a couple of years ago. I don't think it's still there. What uh, what pre emergent are you using primarily, Tim? The herbicide pre emergent herbicide. Uh, Accord, I believe, is what it's called. Yeah, I use some of that for mile a minute uh, on my property and. Um, I was a little bit late, uh, but I did notice that in areas where I sprayed, I still got some mile a minute, but I didn't have nearly as much as I did in other areas. Is that a granular there. product or is that water dispersible granular or what format? Yes. What format is yeah. Yep. Yeah. Water granule. dispersible granule. Are you making any recommendations um, for invasive that are uh, food for the spotted lantern fly? Like if they're in yeah. yeah, Alanthus, grapevine. Um, I'm seeing them all over the um, black walnuts. Seems so in specific areas in the parks where um, we may find these. Are you planning to include any recommendations in the plan that um, will allow us to kind of weigh? Uh, you know, the cost and benefit of leaving or you know, <laughs> what we attack first and what the effects will be if we leave some versus right. 
take them down. I hadn't gotten that far really other than than just finding Atlantis. Um, not a lot of it, but uh, here and there. Uh, I believe there was a fair amount of Atlantis in in uh, Twin um, Twin Hills. Um, I think that's mainly where we saw Atlantis. Um, but that's it's something I can definitely. Part of, it's, it's part of the Bill's and Atlantis slayer. He's been taking it out. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm making a note of that to include that. And also, yeah, I've noticed it um, heavily on grapevines. Yeah. Um, also, I have noticed them on black walnuts too. Yep. Quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you, <laughs> that's the conundrum, right? So you start removing, mm -hmm. what are you left with, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then also considering your, you, your parks are little islands in a sea of, suburban uh, trees that you don't control. So how much impact is that versus the impact, the, how much positive impact is that making in controlling uh, spotted lamp five versus the negative impacts of, of removing those trees and the benefits that they provide? I think the one other thing that I know Ron has commented on, I've seen, I've started seeing it, is, is the Japanese wine berry. And we're seeing yeah. that explode pretty rapidly in some areas and you know it um it's really tough once it gets going so yeah there's a lot of wineberry over here in in twin oaks um or twin hill sorry um that's the main kind of enormous patch i've seen it but i saw it in bird park um Probably, it's probably in in all your parks, but yeah, that's that's um, you know on the list for sure. I mean, it does have the benefit of having delicious berry, sweet berries, um, but you've also you know you've got native berries in there too. You've got blackberries, you've got black uh, raspberries. So um, if you get rid of the rind berry, then then those would be would be uh, you know better off. Uh, are we doing, is Maine Park part of your plan? No. no? Okay. The Japanese knotweed is, is becoming pretty invasive on the hillside as you come up to Park Ridge moving down. <coughs> so that may be something that we can look at for, I don't know, thought, next time. It's kind of open or we can apply some of these techniques yeah. to that park as well. You know, once we get some recommendations and yeah. look at some similarities, we can cross over and use those same recommendations in other areas. We did a lot of work on not weed in Maine Park last year, right? Yeah. We did a fair amount of oh, okay. pool oil side and the pool side. Like that. So okay, so then this is what's going up further. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Okay, if you have any other thoughts or comments afterwards, please just, you know, send me an email and um, I'd be happy to to follow up or, you know, if, you, if it's just a comment, like, please address this, you know, make a note of it and let me know if you have any questions. I'll, I'll share the link that he's referring to, all the links for all what we just went through. So you'll be able to poke through and um, kind of do those different dimension and renderings too. Uh, re regarding that, will I don't know how this is served um, systemically, we don't want to interfere with your work. Are you, obviously we wouldn't be able to, I doubt we'd be able to change anything, but just being on the system, will that interfere with your activity? So, meaning like computer system wise? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. The only time that that's kind of come up was when I'm collecting data in the field, the GIS person might say, let me know when you're done so I can make a change. But you're not collecting data, so I don't think it would be a problem if you're just viewing something. Well, they share this publicly. It's usually like in a read-only version. So okay. we do the same thing with our public mapping on our GIS uh, through our web page. So it's not in a format where you can edit the data. And because you can't edit it, it's cloud data. It doesn't interfere with what he's doing or make changes to the, the existing layer data. Should you notice any performance issues, <laughs> uh, let us know because maybe we're 
Yeah. And, and we're, we're likely to look at it way past normal quitting time. Hours, yeah. If there is normal quitting time in your line of work. <laughs> yeah, it was an hour and a half ago. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, randomly, for when we finally reach the read only version, if we could tweak the colors, it might be a little bit more readable. Uh, some of the layers, when they get overlapped, it just becomes a little unreadable. I, I mean, right. at least from the uh, computer version right now. So, uh, if it's yeah, not too long. definitely. Yes, thank you for that comment. Um, and th again, this is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you there's so much information. Yeah. The only way to manage that is to turn some layers off. But um, but definitely got got to work on optimizing the colors and some of some of the things is cleaning up the edges of the polygons and stuff like that so that they make a little more sense ha hasn't been done yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, bye. Bye. Bye, Jim. Okay. It's eventually going to be live publicly. Yeah, or just okay. yeah. Produce a report and recommendations, which will be presented to you guys. Yeah. But I mean, it'll be a bit so public can access this. Yeah, we'll put it on the web page. Sure, that's great. Any other comments or questions relative to the something? Wait, something. Real quick one. I mean, we no black locust. I mean, not just some difficult get rid of, but do we actually consider it invasive? So interesting that uh, that woody woody species of the Great Lakes, um, they're in the state in the upper Midwest that does indeed consider it invasive, even though it's native. It's not yeah, native. I mean, I, was, well, I looked at a map, New York State, uh, we don't, and it is native, that's what I was wondering. So I, I think the look, thinking about that area of Twin Hills, um, just south of the or down the slope of the apartments, and then the section of Bird Park that's adjacent to Washington Road. It's it's practically all that's there, and all those trees are going to do is fall over. And even if we wanted to plant new trees, the problem I have with it is we invest the time and the money in planting the new trees, and then the old dead tree falls over and crushes the tree with five years growth on it. So. I mean, the, the question, I, again, I'm not going to jump the, jump the gun here, but those, that species concentration, I wonder if the, the output is just clear it, start over, like take not just forestry mower, but like there are certain areas that just need not just the brush taken out, but the trees need to be taken out too because the density of the black locust is so high, you're never going to get anywhere because the new trees won't have any light to, to build them. Yeah, so. I don't see what he says. Yeah, that, that, that invasive Oxford the tour at Board Park, that was his recommendation for the Eastern side. He said, you can invest a lot of effort trying to do invasive removal and you just you should cut all the trees down, grind it all out, plant trees, put grass between the trees, mow it for 20 years until those trees get big enough and then you can let it go. Turn it back into a forest at that yeah, point. But he said, you know, that would actually be the best solution for the eastern 150 to whatever is left of privet. So just mow it all down and mm -hmm. just do a plant, just do a tree, and then people can pick it between them. It's useful. And then at some future date, you just let it go back and stop mowing. So the, the Twin Hills uh, restoration area, I was there this morning. The sugar maples that we planted. Uh, they're inch and a half. They're doing great. There are so few places that I would invest the time and money to plant the tree because there's always like a, a 50 year old scraggly looking thing on an angle like this right above it. So, so you, you only have so many spots. So that, uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to, again, and I, I'm not an expert, right? but I, I tend to lean toward clear it and plant it properly, um, right? Uh, it, it, yeah, it will be painful, right? And, you know, in, in that period when, you know, everybody's pissed off that we've clear cut a bunch of trees and all that green space is gone, but this is a long game we're playing, right? 
Yeah, and and we, to a certain we didn't, we didn't play the long game initially, right? When we had the land, we didn't plan uh, right dollar. Piece yeah, we ignored it. Seventy five. Right, yeah. and so to a certain extent, we okay, we've lost fifty years. Right. Um, but do we perpetuate the problem, or do we you know, come up with a a strategy that says yeah, you know, some of these spaces just need to be you know addressed you know in a very aggressive manner? Uh, I'm not the one qualified to, to say it, but I would I would be Interested to hear that, I, I think. Yes. I don't want to put an idea in his head, but that's I'm interested to know if that's what one of the recommendations would be. I think there's so I read some papers or some rules that'll be at about 70% of the biomass or so, I think, with is non-native. At that point, it's it's pretty well a lost cause because you is you if you you how do you if you clear out 70%, you might as well just clear it all out and plan it properly. There's there's some kind of tipping point, some of the papers were. They said if it's much above this non-native, then you're wasting. You're, you're better off just starting over. And clearing in that manner does that also mean taking out stumps and uh, yeah, going just yeah, below the grade down the dirt and below uh, to get all the roots of some of the brush that'll grow back? I, or I think you have to in order to be able to maintain it. So as the seed bank is is worked through, you're constantly mowing. Um, Mowing that down. Yeah, so oh, like doing right, the right. Blinders, okay. the, the, actual, yeah. the forestry mulching right. doesn't work uh, alone because you still have all the invasives there to deal with as they sprout back up. I bet you if we tell Rudy, who's a grass expert, hey, we want great looking grass <laughs> and nothing else. Or four, buddy. <laughs> all we want is four or three horses in here, no problem. The trees in this space. Five dollars for nine dollars. It's called forest. <laughs> But it, it, for me, this all goes back to, and I'm thinking Bird Park, but for me, this goes back to, I think, the conversation you, you and I had, I don't know, three years ago, which is, this is a conversation not about invasive management. This is a conversation about active space management, understanding that the design is natural, right? Is na native use or natural use, right? Not active use. It's, this is a question of, how do we understand the scale of work and the investment, the initial investment, and then the ongoing space management investment that needs to be understood over the next 30 years, right? Uh, again, we because if we're going to tear that out, right, we also need to have the conversation about the trail design, right? <laughs> Where the trail's going and, and wildflowers and this and that, and there's all kinds of stuff that right, if we're going there, we need to have a full plan in place, which again says, okay, what's it gonna to cost to get it going? What's it gonna take on an annual maintenance basis? Who's doing it? <laughs> How do we fund it? Right, all those pieces. So I keep coming back to, this is a capacity discussion. The designs are gonna be fantastic. But how do we understand the, the structural need to actively maintain these spaces? It's not just Bird Park, right? It's Twin Hills, it's Rob Hollow. How do, because again, for me, it boils down to, we have done what we can for fun and it's nice and it works and no one's complaining, but if we're going to say, we want to actively manage these spaces as a community, how do we build a plan to do it? Because Nature Conservancy only has so much capacity, right? Each one of us only has so much capacity. Well, I don't know. It seems like you have lots of capacity, but the little area one. I think there's guides from Penn State on where to put your effort and how to do that, you know, for municipalities and stuff. And they just they they're they're really helpful and they, they have a whole set of publications. You know, they advocate take your best areas and save those. Right. Because people want to go firefight and tackle the most invaded area. And Penn State says, no, don't do that. Pick, go do your survey, pick your best areas, save them. And the ones that can't be saved, take yeah. them down. But you know, so so you you put your resources into restore grabbing the most acres you can before the invasives take them over, right. instead of pouring all your resources into a few acres that are really in bad shape. So right. they have they have some good, they have some good guys or like like I said, articles and things on giving just like what you said, how when you're in a situation like this and you have limited resources, well, how do you deploy them? I just keep going back to last summer when I was in Wales um, and we were near Cardiff and they have this river trail and these trees are absolutely stunning. Some of them are huge. Some of them are younger. 
but they have this great diversity of trees and they're actively managed, right? It, that's what it finally dawned on me. I'm like, wow, these are gorgeous trees. They've been doing something for a very long time. Um, how do they stay ahead of that, right? At some point you can kind of say, well, we don't have to do much, but you start to say, I've got a tree, I've got to do things with it, right? I, it's going to die, I need to plant another one, right? There's, you start something, but then you also have this management plan and framework and the space, understanding of the space that I feel like we're all dancing around this, but how do we synthesize and come up with a plan and say, at some point we're going to fund it. And maybe it's, you know, going out and getting kids to, you know, raise pennies. I don't know. Um, but part, part of this, there's an educational component. I think you have uh, people, some people who still look at natural parks as their wilderness. They don't need anything. They, they'll, nature will take care of itself. Don't touch it. Right. Don't call the deer and let everything go. And then the other, there's another side which says, I don't like seeing fallen trees. Can't we? get rid of everything and clean it up and make it look like the main park. So part of this educating kind of intent, like you're saying, and also, um, I guess, educating for each each area also having to do with, is this a lost cause? We have to do this. Uh, but educating the public that it, that they're, they're basically, you know, you were, he was talking about the islands of suburbia, yeah. uh, and these are little islands. They're not wilderness by any means. They're natural islands, which are refuge uh, at times, um, but they, they need active management. I, I think so. where I've seen the most similar cases is just when you're doing uh, selective harvesting forestry <clears throat> and you're doing forestry management, you have zones. But for, again, like the Peter said, a lot of people, when you say, well, let's bring in a forester and do a plan, a lot of times, it's the cutting the trees down so they don't get too thick. So you have fewer, healthier trees that you need to do. One of the key things is often it's not as thinning in the first place. So the, the trees that are there are healthy and aren't falling over and, and things like that. You have fewer, healthier trees. But, you know, a forest, a true forester will go through and you'll, they'll zone it and they'll tell you, I, mean, I, I help manage a property for a church and we do invasive removal and everything is all zoned out. We have a 20 year plan. It's actually pretty straightforward. And because you keep at it, it's it's like right. mowing grass. If you mow your grass every other week, it's not so bad. You say, oh, it's May, and I'm going to mow my grass in August. When you go to mow your grass in August, <laughs> it's not so easy. It's the exact trees, forests are no different. They just have to basically be mowed or some basic maintenance. If you do it, usually it's once every five years, and mm -hmm. you're good. If you go do a full pass per acre once every five years, clean it out, remove the invasives, thin the trees, then you leave it for five years. After we get to a quality... Yeah, you got to get it. There, but then it's so, really low cost. You, I did the numbers. The, the cost to mow, maintain a mowed area versus a wooded area is about 15 to 1. It's actually really cheap to maintain yeah. a, a treed area once you, if you just do it you know, once every couple of years. Yeah, that requires, right, seeing the long. But to Peter's point, people don't realize it's no, you know, planting a tree is no different than a cornfield. It takes their certain maintenance to maintain it. Mm -hmm. and, but the assumption is, you know, it'll maintain itself. And yeah, it will if you have forest fires. Right. So if you let me set for a park a fire once a year, I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we're going to move on to the next part of the year. <laughs> uh, do we, do, would it be smart to suggest to Tim or ask him for a draft of his recommendations before the final so that we can take a look at what his recommendations are and then? bring up this kind of like obliteration of various areas and how would that play into what would he recommend? Well, I was thinking even just to see a draft to make sure we're headed, he's headed in the right direction for us, not in terms of the answer we want, but the format and the content. Um, so I think that's great. Yeah, to get yeah. Out. Any, any chance to kind of see those mm -hmm. ideas, I think it's also. Um, I see Rudy is writing. <laughs> No, that's a really good idea, and I, I'm, I'm hoping, and I, I, we haven't specifically told this to Tim, but given, you know, the need for the long-term, probably high investment initially program, I'm hoping he can suggest phasing, and also, you know, if it's a 
and I'm making up a number from the air. If it's a million dollar program, you know, what can we do over the next three years for a hundred grand or something? You know, and where to most aptly target that. Um, so we're not overwhelmed by but if you had a hundred million dollars, here's what you can do. I did the medical one to be assumed for like forestry technicians with yeah. proper brush cutters and treatment. It was about a hundred to two hundred thousand to do the entire park system. <laughs> but that's with people with the proper tools. If you ever seen someone work with a brush cutter, it, it, it goes so fast. You'd be super. It's a, it's basically a table saw in a barn. And, and and the biggest hang up we've I think a lot of people had is that expecting the brush to be clean. Yeah, and that doubles or triples the cost. So if you're okay with someone just going through with a wand and then just getting it, you can clear it pretty fast, or relatively fast. And then you know, then you have replanting, which takes that that's something volunteers can do because that takes a lot of tending with time to get the trees established. Uh, you know, uh, but no, it's 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 if you can get forestry technicians with the right equipment, it's not that. The, the two man crew do an acre to two acres an hour. Well, we saw that to a degree with the uh, the Twin Hills and then the year two before that, the Bird Park yeah. project. Where this is even just hand, these are guys walking by hand yeah. with a brush cutter, um, you know, a back powered brush cutter, and you know, it, it just you know, they just zing 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 zing, they're just walking around, just zipping, and, and it's like a weed whacker for, for a brush. Yeah, okay, uh, we got to move on. Uh, public works updates on grounds, facilities, trees, etc. Uh, Bill and Rudy, just real quick, I'll run down something, and Rudy might want to jump into uh, this kind of upgrade that we've done on the map and explain that to you. Probably over at Bird at the pavilion, we replaced a pretty good section of railing, about eighty foot wide. Continue with that same look from going down to the soccer field. So we'll. We'll chip away as that at that as we have time, and you know we we yeah, can. It's really it. good. So wait, what is that? Uh, but the the rented shelter off of Beedling coming down the hill. The shelter is tucked in the woods. Yeah. Um, also removed those benches that were sunk down in the lower flat area. Uh, there were three of them through there. Another one was buried in the woods, like <laughs> something out of a book. You know, like way popular. back. So the guys did not believe me it was there, but it's gone. Um, over at uh, Williamsburg, you'll notice kind of what we're trying to catch up on the last two months real quick for you. Um, during that drought area, we that drought time, we did bag um, all the new plantings at both Rockwood and Williamsburg. Um, they were, those bags were tended to by our staff and um, I don't think we lost anything yet. So uh, we, we, we held on through that. Um, we also mulched uh, just for the first year or two all the tree rings over at Rockwood to outcompete weed, grass, um, all that type of stuff. We're doing Williamsburg uh, this week and maybe into next if we get, uh, get there. So uh, we're kind of trying to do everything we can for, for the two stand, two part that we uh, replanted. <laughs> um, did a lot of curl fencing repair to just kind of like last minute efforts of stainless steel zip ties and things like that across the parks we normally do. Um, upgraded some LED lighting over the concession stand that had some old, uh, real big T12 fixtures in there, like 14 footers, the massive ones you see. Um, uh, also over at uh, Bradford, uh, we did open quotes for that project. We had one bidder, it was extremely high. Uh, commission decided to reject that. Uh, we since then are piecing that project out into quotes, a fencing probably a fencing portion, a topsoil earthwork portion to reseed the infield, catch the right grade of the field to make that whole multi, you know, use space one, one area, and then a drainage portion of that as well. Um, so it wasn't quite a palatable project enough. Um, it just no bidders we sent out to numerous landscapers, both small, medium, large. A lot of outfits with no no desire on that. So um, we're going to go the quoted route and look at um, piecing it together ourselves and running it ourselves. Um, over, kind of keep it on that same route. Uh, early June, uh, we got some direction from the manager to get going on the parks and wayfair or parks and wayfinding signage, everything like that. 
with Kelowna. So we met with Kelowna through June, July, at a small internal group. Um, we're looking this Friday to have a final meeting on a design packet. So we'll have a design standard we can then go get quotes for, uh, get it in the budget, get things in the ground, and, and have a tangible outcome, hopefully, this fall. With, uh, we'll see what we can do. We don't know what we can do. We don't know what they'll cost. Um, so next meeting, I'll have something for you. But that was our direction was, you know, this group had been putting a lot of effort into it. Just get it going and, and get moving. Um, so next meeting, we'll have something for you. It'll be a full design standard. We kept it simple. We're looking at entryway identifications to all the park systems, uh, sports fields component. Uh, we'll probably reach back out to you for locations. So once I get a message schedule with text and everything like that ready to go, I'll probably reach back out to you guys and we'll look at locations, make sure that we're doing this right. Um, but we'll get the design portion. We'll, we'll, we're going to have quotes ready to go here soon. So um, right. this group will be kind of heavily involved after we meet this Friday and we, we keep it going. But the manager wants to get this done. So um, we're, we're pushing forward on that. Uh, so we'll have a kind of a draft letter coming out to stakeholders commission on the, that whole process and where we're at with it, just so everyone's caught up before we do any kind of tangible um, and then Rudy can speak on the, the mapping effort that we um he devised here and then at the kind of conservancy and everyone's requests over the years of something that makes life easier. So we have two things here i um, share with you. Um, one is a table. Uh, if you look at the parks map and the table, um, you guys had requested that we look at surveying all the perimeter um, adjacent uh, shared parcel lines with park property. So at our GIS guy break this down into each one of the parks, and you can see the number of parcels that are adjacent and share a property line with a park and the total linear feet for each, each uh, uh, of those parks. You can see some of these are a mile and so forth. So uh, total total uh, length of shared property lines is just over, or right around seven miles, 5,280, whatever the map is, for 36,000 linear feet. Uh, and there's 342 parcels. So it's substantial what we have. Um, the reason I put this together, or had our GIS guy throw this together, is that I want to get a, uh, a predetermined uh, budget number from Gateway Engineers, or they do our survey work for us. So I needed to have some sort of, a, you know, an idea on what the total linear footage was and how many properties. That's basically going to give us our, our number. So we, we meet with Gateway every every second week uh, on Tuesday mornings and discuss all the ongoing projects we have and just discuss, you know, things with our wish lists and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but what they're going to do is they're going to look at LIDAR data, uh, which is very uh, detailed. And they should be able to provide us information where we can identify the boundaries without going to the... the the problem was it's going to be it's, it's going to be expensive to do survey. You got to do research. You got to pull everything together. They get, get out in the field. You're going to have to uh, put pins in. Pins up end up disappearing. They end up getting pulled. So I think with the late lidar data, um, you know, we can send some notices to some some property owners that are adjacent to the parks and just let them know what we're doing. Give them a copy of the lidar data and show them where the the, the property boundaries are, and just you know, kind of nicely. Kind of let them know that parks are park properties being used for other other uh, uses, um, you know, private, and go from there. So we'll we'll get you guys some more information once we get to that. But I wanted to let you know and and show you how big of a project this would be if we would go out the the survey. Um, I think it's probably going to be a pretty big expense, and is it really worth it to do that? And we can do it other ways. I think you're not even giving notice for some, you know. All you have to do is let the homeowner right. know that and hey, that's, we're, we're aware right. that you're using this. This is a avoid the adverse possession and those type of things. We're not waiving our use. Right. We're, we're just not letting we're you know, speaking against you, but we're just not waiving that it's our property. Right. So, yeah. So we'll, that'll be the first phase. Politically, which, that's probably a little more appealing. It's more palatable. So, right. So. Right. Right. And but you've already put them on notice. So. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for. Stick that in a legal file to get to identify that homeowner that they may be using it, but it's you know we reserve our rights now. That's great. And, and um, so we're going to take that approach first, and we'll see where it takes us. And that mitigates the adverse possession, right? 
That's what our engineer and our solicitor is told me. Subsequent to that, I think we've already talked about this, as projects are happening near boundaries, is that is it is that a good time to put in some type of physical marker? If work is if work is in that area, right, right. And, and then, then the third piece, because that's um, the gap with notifying the homeowner, the municipality knows the gap is still the park user. Park user user doesn't know where the boundary is. So that could be a problem um, in that. Public doesn't know what's public. Yeah, I think we could come up with some creative ideas. Like, for example, at the golf course for 150 yard marker, we would plant our providing some small providing at the 150 yard mark instead of putting plates in a fairway. So now you have something that identifies that distance. Uh, Every hole you have a certain bush or a certain shrub that gives you a dip. So maybe a you natural know, yeah. Marker. So maybe we look at something like that. You that's know, great. yeah. Okay. Well, we have the converse like that. The by Youngwood path that goes across the homeowner's yard, and there, we should do the converse. We should, you know, like we should pay them a lease or, or a right to use that for public use because, you know, they're being nice not blocking it. I mean, they, you know, they, they, somebody gets hurt in their yard or something like that. I'm not sure I would do that personally from a liability point of view. So, what about, so I'm, I'm thinking of. I know situations where there's intrusion, but it's not really nothing's going on there anyways. Yeah, right. So it doesn't really matter. There's other cases where it does impinge on the public right. So I know a place I think in Highland or uh, where somebody put a fence up that's keeping me off a trail essentially, and it's a rough trail. Um, and that requires a permit. If they didn't have a permit, then we go back into the records and we see, and I don't think they would have been issued a permit to put a sign or a, a fence up in that area. You know, yeah, so then notice will have to be provided. And, and that would be after getting, let's say, the LIDAR data. Right. And so if we need to go to the next level on some of these things, landscape dumping or driveways. And things pick like our battles if there's two yeah. or three things that right. specifically, no, we don't attack everything. If there's two or three things that really are great. Right. Like, you're, like, you're blocking right away into a park. Yeah, that that should be dealt with. I think, uh, for example, the land of Iroquois on the other side of the circle, it's it's wild basically, and the person's been mowing, right? You know, and and using that. There's no problem, I don't think, with yeah. that. And again, it's just letting them know we maintain our right to this land. Well, but there's other cases have... where it does damage right. the public use, and that's where I'd be concerned. We're going to have an issue. Down, we're not an issue, but we're going to have a situation down there. We've been uh, doing a lot of televising the storm sewers now, and now we found some defects in the storm sewer that runs through that property. That's our property, so we're going to have to provide some notice and some some things down there to repair that sewer. So that that's going to kind of somewhat correct the yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. So Rudy, this is a great um, great first step. It gives us a sense of the scale. Right. Of right. Work. So yeah, that's awesome. Okay, Thank you very much. we'll continue to work through this, and you know, I, I didn't want. To, I, we were working towards a budget number, but I, I don't think we really need that at this point. We'll work it internally and through the engineer's office, and and be able to provide some enough information to at least get started. And then down the road, if we feel we need to go to that next level of, of uh, survey, then we can always take that next step. Yeah, I assume that could be pinpointed at a few right. problem locations, right? Yeah. Uh, before we leave this uh, item, Williamsburg, new trees, uh, guards for the fall. The delivery guards are on them. I, I have other ones that can be used that run all over the pocket part. Uh, I can get them on there as well. Um, that would be superior, I think, because they're taller and they're uh, also not going to attract the no, I can see a link to the Amazon. I've seen it like Amazon and Cushing. Oh, yeah, actually. It's similar to that. Like, yeah. We have it from last year's purchase through that budget item. So that's what we'll use it for. Thanks. Oh, Any, your cost of labor that's quite expensive. Any uh, questions for um, Bill or Ruby about maintenance items before we move on? That's why I don't think this other one too. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. I thought it was. Yeah, really yeah. Right. <laughs> So the other thing we did with GIS was we uh, created, it's been requested to create some sort of a grid system for the parks. 
So Michael Macy Corps GIS guy, he threw these together. The smaller squares are 100 foot squares, 100 foot between uh, uh, lateral latitude and longitude, uh, maybe west and longitude. Um, he used a tool to just create these, uh, these grid systems. Uh, the other is 200 feet. So we want to produce these, and I just wanted to get a feel for what the thought is of how how defined we need to get with these. What we will do is we can pr produce these static maps, but we're all going to also going to produce a um, uh, public facing GIS map with layers specifically for parks. So we now have a public map with uh, sewers and streets and parcels and all that stuff on it. We're, we're going to do one that just has the park stuff on it. So it'll have the, the trails and the paths, uh, the tree inventories that we have that we already established for uh, some of the parks. And then this grid system will be on here too. So you can turn this on and off. You can click on it. So if you're out in the park and you're doing work with somebody or, you know, you want to, you want to meet somebody somewhere, you can give them F17 and they can click on that and they can find F17, locate that grid and be within either 100 or 200 feet of what the location is. I know the police or fire department had asked for some marking at some point, like a couple in the park. Is there, yeah, is we there, can. I, is there the thing that I this, this side to like say it's a few places, say this is grid so and so. We can we can probably do that. And what the way it'll be set up is the grid will just cover each park individually. And once you turn that layer on, all those grids will light up. So they'll they'll be displayed on the map, but all the grids will light up at once. So you're not gonna have to turn on a grid for each park. So, and then you can turn them off if they become like, if you zoom in and these numbers are on here, you know, the, the, uh, the labels, sometimes they get in the way when you're trying to look for things, you know, when you're, when you're actually using them out for other uses. So, um, so that's our plan. That's awesome. But the, um, As a, sorry, yeah, so we're probably gonna have to monkey around with this a little bit too. Once, and, you know, I talked to him once we get it set up, um, you know, different colors possibly that are more visible once people start using it. And I mean, you know, this will be available on your phone. So you go to our website, you can click open a public facing GIS and you can work, work on this out in the, out in the field. If I'm walking through Twin Hills Park and I come upon uh, two tires and a That's automotive seat, which is there, <laughs> um, I would be able to open my app and- Tell us it's in Bird Park and it's at F-17 and we'll know exactly where to go. So, you know, we'll be all tree falling, you know, leaning, something. So I'm probably going to create more work for us, but uh, it's what it is. <laughs> You'll spend less time looking and more time. <laughs> but I think, it'll, I think this will really be helpful. I mean, we've been trying to work with something. They, I, I don't know if they just developed this tool, but uh, Mike Misik was able to uh, put this together using a tool that creates these grid systems. So, so yeah. what do you, what's the general consensus? Do you think we need to be... The smaller blocks or the bigger blocks would be sufficient. Was it 200 feet? Oh, by bigger, I mean cover more area. So smaller or more defined, but is that too far in? That's 100 feet. Do we really need to get down to 100 feet? Or yeah, big so, parts and small parts. For the smaller parts, I feel like we need more detail just to, and the bigger parts, the larger bridge. What's the trade off? Like, what are the costs? Is it? Oh, there's no cost. It's just. You pick one, we're going to use it. So the layer will have to be consistent. It will either all have to be 100 feet or all 200. Feet. The trade off, I would say, is if you like this up and you zoom in far enough, it's probably going to cover some of your detail, depending upon how thick we make the lines and the, and the actual labels for each block. But you can turn it off and you can actually click on it and we'll, we'll, we'll develop a pop up too that'll tell you what grid you're in. I you almost feel like this is too detailed. Like yeah. It's overwhelm you. Yeah. Or this, yeah. It's, I mean, considering we haven't had anything, right, right, it's it'll it's get you in the ballpark. In the ballpark to say, yeah. yeah, I mean, again, P14 and there's 200 uh, feet. I mean, you think yes. about it, you know, you look at the soccer field and uh, diagonally, you got two and a half blocks covering that. So, probably like an average house lot, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it really doesn't matter either way, we can do either one, but I'd be afraid from a public use perspective that the 100 foot grid might might scare people away yeah. if i'm in the park and i see something and i go onto the grid and i think oh, uh is it 31 or 32 or 30 i'm just not going to do it and so and we can um you know we'll produce um static maps to pdfs that we can have links on too that you can generate your own pdf just like we have the park maps and all the other stuff too so i think this looks a little cleaner to me with 200 foot square mm -hmm. Just, that's just my opinion. But, but I agree in the smaller parks. The smaller I think parks, wouldn't it like 
probably be even smaller than one of the two. Yeah, let me but, yeah, like, let me talk to Mike. I mean, I was really just do you really even need a grid for like Rockwood or yes. Airfoot? I yeah. mean, it, it, you, right. you, just, yeah. you can yell at somebody, you know, not that far away or hit for the baseball. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, do you really need one for a small part? I mean, in terms of reporting issues, not yeah, in like terms Williamsburg, of Yeah, like Williamsburg, if you get it back yeah. in the back part of it, that's yeah. small, a medium-sized part. So. Yeah. But not like, um, not in terms of meeting, because right. we obviously can see right, across, right, right. but if you want to say there's something happening at the corner of... Oh, we might be able to do something like that, you know, create two different grids. It would have to be two separate layers because they're different, you know, different, uh, they're laid out differently, so... And you'd have to turn different layers on, so it would, it would be two versus one. Mm -hmm. But that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But definitely the 200 foot looks cleaner. Yeah, Unless... for Main Park, you know, Rob Hollow, uh, Twin Hills, Bird Park. This also served as what you were talking about, like if somebody's injured. You know, we'll have, I have to make sure that this is locked in. So, you know, once we start using this, and if we do something like that, we can't change it. So we have to. My, my thought would be we would start using this and use it for a while and make sure everything's okay and we don't have to fiddle around with it or move things around. Um, and then we can establish that as a, you know, I mean, you can use coordinates on your phone. You know, it, realistically, you can send X and Y coordinates. So right. you send a text and you can you can drop a flag and send that to somebody or see where you're at. So, quicker. yeah, and it's probably more accurate too, you know, because you're using global latitudes on it too, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that's something very helpful for the conservancy work. Yeah, volunteer work, right? Just tracking things too. So, Tim, Tim could have used this. <laughs> so we'll so we'll we'll throw something together and then we can always change it. Too, so. uh, just regarding Rafferton and the bids and what's going to happen next. Um, so. Bill and I met out there a couple of months ago and we were looking at the invasives and then uh, we started uh, the conversation kind of led into storm water issue there and how the field is wet, which then took us into you know, looking at how could we create a swale around the edge and is there a way to make this a little bit more um, of a community resource and asset beyond just um, as a playing field. So we, we just we were throwing, I was throwing around ideas and talking about the um, uh, possibly creating a trail, just an easy rectangular walking trail around the, the perimeter of the park, which could serve a couple of different purposes, exercise, um, you know, parents who were there watching kids could give them a place to uh, stand on the side, keep invasives from creeping in, maybe um, combining it with a swale to manage some of the water from, from seeping in also. Um, so if, since the, the plans were not bid on, or they, you know, we, they were, but since we've rejected them and we're going to go a different route, um, the plans as they are do not include any sort of a trail. Would this potentially open up the opportunity for discussion to take a look at something like that? It's just something simple, a mulched walking trail. Um, we, we took the profile of what was added along Cedar Boulevard. Okay. Um, because it's been holding up well with heavy rains, with traffic. Um, you can imagine well, that long along the public work road. lot next to um, the, the aggregate so, trail that we put in last year. Yeah, there, there's an alternate to look uh, at that on the one right. side of the fence. Yeah, moving it in to add that maintenance slash all purpose. Uh, would it connect the whole way around? Probably not at this point. Okay. Um, there could be future work in that swale area. We have drainage work that might unfold into more. Um, so maybe let us work that area first and see where it goes. But that thought is out there okay. to, to, we know that there's a path higher up that would be a cool little loop. Um, we're, we're aware of that. So we're not gonna close ourselves out just by replacing fence and everything. So we did look into a surface as an alternate. Cost-wise, probably won't see that this round for $80,000 with fencing, drainage, um, importing good soil, uh, you know, to get that field. The idea was to improve the field, so. Um, with those other amenities in mind, they're still there incorporated. Yeah. Okay. We do plan to put the fence in to allow for a path yeah. or a walkway on the outside of it, though, so that it's not inside the perimeter of the fence, and it'll be along that slope, but on the top of it, on That's the bottom great. side. Yeah, great. So we hold it in. Great. Great. Glad to hear that that um, that conversation went further. Um, and then related to that, I was at the Rob Hollow 
Parkwood not very long ago, walking along there, and I'm curious about the maintenance of that. Is there a plan for the weeds that are coming up through that? The contractor is, we're still owed replacement planting, replacement plantings for stuff that did not leaf out this past spring. So he's recently been put on notice um, that that needs remedy. So anything you see that is a dead twig will be a plant again. Um, he wanted to just kind of feather some species in. We want to stick with what was planned and derived because it was a nice mix of some odd things throughout there that were cool. Um, but short of that, in terms of um, the trail maintenance and everything through there, he's going to be ripping through planting some trees here in the fall. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't maintain it. Um, it'll be on the list for spring. I have some Atlantis farther down over the bank there to do. Um, so I can close those trails and, and tree edges as well. But there's just, we've been looking at poison ivy patches leading to the pool versus that right now. So uh, Along the main park with the, the planting, uh, the more formal planting that's there's been I saw thistle and other stuff growing in there um, it's inside where the rose bushes are so there's a lot of weeds growing in there I we have we those beds are maintained contractually where we have some other problem areas through town that we've been um, giving that contractor a little bit of notice as well so yeah, it was surprising because in all these years, I've never really actually noticed. Yeah, us, it, us as well. We've been seeing some areas. It was quite noticeable enough to. Yeah. yeah. By the Chelsea Golden Rain, we've been having too. That's the true. weeds are growing yeah. at an incredible pace. And, uh, it's been warm and it's been wet. You know, for, and it's pretty amazing. You can see something. Hey, that wasn't there three years ago. Yeah, now it's this tall. The, the, the tennis center beds are a great example. Of that. I mean, it's just this it's trying to clear them out for every tournament. And it's like the next Monday. It's, and normally by this time of July, it's drying out. Yeah, it's it's down, down. You get them once and it's clean for a month. Yes. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, commission update. Uh, uh, this is real quick. Uh, trash contract is um, going to be voted on. Um, so I think Laura Lilly put something out on uh, social media. Um, There's an email. Uh, email. Yeah. Yeah. So um, look at it. Uh, that is your commissioner on your opinion. So it is obviously a hot topic. The basic options are leave it as the as it is, would go with the Westmoreland, but put out what you want, um, versus automated pickup with uh, waste management. Where so, yeah, automated pickup is going to be well as baseline a 96 gallon trash can and a 96 gallon recycling can. Um, that like you you face them you you put them out toward the street and the machine comes in yeah the well, coder okay yeah, to some extent there is, it, it'll be somewhat manual um because of our trees or terrain street parking they can't completely go automated like some places have they'll have to roll them over to the truck then there'll be an arm that'll bump them into their either the front bin or the side and then it'll bump it back into the compactor but Wait, so it's current trash collector does that most of my neighborhood has the ones the studies and, the, and they just go down and grab them and dump them it's all out of it yeah so at least where they have them they, they're on a lot of people have them yeah. they may not have the 96 the richard 96 containers yeah they're big, yeah, they're yeah. big. that's big you think like the the some of the containers you've seen out here are, are 64 62 yeah, yeah. it probably is yeah you know, a lot of people, we all went to rollers bought the blue can yeah they're there. probably 64 yeah. gallon yeah. 96 is Pretty darn big. Yeah. So I listened to the meeting. It was a lot of data, um, a lot of good comments and questions. No one, I don't think, asked the question: How is, you know, my 85 year old neighbor going to move a 96 gallon can, even if it's on her front patio? How is she going to get it to the curb? They have the ability to downsize if okay. the, so they can get a 64, okay. a smaller can. After a trial period, they have the ability to do that okay. at no cost. That's that's good because after their trash starts piling up, well, on their front, the, the nice thing is they don't have that much. I mean, she probably doesn't have that much garbage anyway. So yeah, that, that's a question. Yeah. Also, the properties that are a big hill, right? They have no like access. Uh, another another been, no no discussion or, or issues this time about separating recyclables or uh, so everything's going single stream. Right, really? okay. and glass is going in too. Yeah. Yeah, back in. And yeah. what about landscape yeah. materials? That's all. There, there, there's, there's no organic waste. Put it that way. Allow. 
Uh, no, there's no organic waste separate. Oh, okay. Everything that you throw for the trash has to go into the trash can, has to fit in with the lid shut. Yeah. And the same with the recycling can if, if we get automated. So cardboard has to be cut up and put into the containers. It can't be, they won't pick it up if it's set separately outside of the container. So you have two containers. You have the ability to purchase an additional one as well. What about um, all the time, like furniture and stuff I see on the road? One time a month. Two, two items once a month for uh, bulk items. Instead of two every week, it'll be two once a month to be determined which week of the month that would be. So you'll have 12 opportunities per year to throw bulk items away up to two per, per time. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Which was the cost? What was the cost difference between them? Uh, I, I, think, I think the, the swing was about $500,000 over the five-year contract. But, but what's interesting is that if you look at it over over the five-year period, the cost of the automated drops over time because you you paid off the cans. Yes. And so ultimately the automated, at least from a projections perspective, is more affordable long-term, right? The, the, the Delta suggests that your automated is more efficient long-term, but this contract, we would be carrying that cost. So it's going to be more expensive. Um, I don't know where this is going to end up. <laughs> uh, right. It's. I think everybody is is kind of thinking about it. So, email your commissioner. Thank you um, on that one. Um, so then uh, we are talking active transportation planning, um, doing that with uh, potentially with Dormont. So doing a joint active transportation plan uh, across municipalities. That's still in the works, but that would be next year. Um, trail. Guidelines would be good for that <laughs> um, because uh, that clearly the parks we rec already have, we all agree parks are part of that. Um, so, you know, how do we um, wrap all this stuff together? And the last thing I'm just going to throw out there is uh, Saturday, be there, Uptown Unveiled. It's a big party. Show up. Um, we want to celebrate the businesses and turn the street back over to everybody. Thank you. Uh, old business. We're going to rip through a few of these because we uh, already talked about them. Communication and signage. Bill gave us up. Uh, I'll be getting with you for the next time. Bennett, did you have any questions or comments relative to signage? No, I was just going to say Phil, Phil gave the best update possible. So thank you, Phil. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, forestry and bases, we did. Thank you, Tim and group. Uh, park design guidelines and trail restoration. I think we just got a plug for the yeah, effort. Yeah, and I do, I've, I've collected, I've done some research and I have collected um, three different park guidelines that I'm gonna go through. They're from different cities, San Diego, Sacramento, so two in California, one in um, Canada, all at different scales. You know, one is 12 pages, which is incredible because it's a great place to start. Um, and it discusses you know, conceptual design guidelines for uh, park design, which I, I don't know if we wanna go there, but I think that the most important piece to this, which starts on page two is looking at, or page three looks at the site amenities, um, which is where this all really got started. And um, things like site furniture, bike rack, drinking fountain, barbecue grill, things like that, not that we have um, grills. But one or two bullet points of where they should be located, um, other details that are important, and then a, a specification of one or two uh, items that are amenities specific that can be specifically that can be ordered for um, uh, our parks. So this one is, you know, just very succinct and sweet, and I'm gonna I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, some of them are, you know, this one's, this one was almost 300 pages, which went into, it was more of a, an engineered, a, a document to be used by township engineers, landscape architects. So, but I do think that there are pieces from it that we can pull. Um, the one which was, which I really liked from the district, this district in, um, Canada had a really nice, um, beginning uh, introduction, which discussed the, you know, the, the importance of the parks and creating a sense of place and creating um, a, uh, the, the, the intention of the guidelines. So you're creating, um, you know, this, this 
this sort of material, this um, thread through the community where people can see that repetition of um, design and um, standards. So, um, and using a document, to make sure that it's a living document that'll continue to change over time. So something that's not created once, but um, that um, isn't, isn't stagnant, but, but that is always um, edited as needed. So having an introduction similar to that might be really nice to have in the beginning. Um, then moving into the site amenities and then moving into trails also. So there are guidelines here on trails. So Peter um, and I hopefully will be able to get together soon or at least even work independently and come back together with some, some recommendations. And um, as Rob had suggested a couple of months ago, maybe the next step is to really to come up with a table of contents have that approved first, your get feedback at the next meeting on our table of contents, and then we can start moving on from there. Okay. Uh, but I think that these three were the best that uh, that I found out there. They may, there may be other ones, but I also don't want to get too deep into the weeds. You don't want to do a doctoral dissertation. Exactly, on exactly. Policies for- Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think, so, so we've started, Peter, we've started. <laughs> Good, let me know when you need more time on okay. the schedule. Okay. Uh, Peter, anything to add to that one? Just that I'm, I have to uh, distill down the Upper St. Clair document that we really thought was already a good baseline okay. for a trail. Great. Thank you. Uh, Richard, main park master plan, any updates? The uh, contractor's been selected. So that's pretty much that's what the team I was on was once that's done, they're on their way. We're working on data collection right now, so uh, Ian's been requesting information from us. That, that was group was just to give him input on the pyramid process, right? Then that that's done as far as right now. We're start, they've started data collection, so we're providing GIS layers and all kind of information He's that they've requested. Dumps of main yeah. park site visits, yeah, lane, inspection, all the long -term. reports, all kind of stuff. Yeah. And Lane worked for Patrick, so she's still on like a ten percent honorary, so she can tell them she knows <laughs> as much as anybody can help. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Rafferton restoration, we talked about. Um, the rejection and questions about the trail going to anything else to add or ask about? Um, I mean, if I could, uh, where can we see the the plans? Like Gateway took, it, it, last time we talked about it, Gateway, it went back to Gateway and then um, is there a way we can see it? The last, the last rendering of what we provided to you guys, okay. um, essentially nothing changed from that, but we're the fact that it's going to quotes and it's not an entire project where GC would cover all these these various smaller trades. There's no real plan, but they are pulling the specs off of that spec for the fencing, you know, nine gauge wire, all that stuff. It's just now smaller chunks. Um, so specifically, it's not that it's not the sexiest thing to pass around, but I, but but anything you want. I mean, I can I can get you what fencing's going up. Um, uh, the drainage work is kind of going to be figured out on site. It's not like yeah. dramatic and drastic and we're like, you know, making the place look different. It's it's just making sure we catch the right grade. So none of it's real, you know, there's not a lot of substance to this round, but I would expect the comp plan and future parks additions to incorporate some cooler pieces probably down the road. Yeah. Um, invasives in the municipal code. Have we heard anything? I have not heard anything from Ian, and I am guilty of plum forgetting about it. Until <laughs> so, so I will fester. Uh, I will contact Ian to see what the, his thoughts are. <laughs> uh, comprehensive plan. I think I went to another meeting since our last <laughs> parks meeting. Pretty sure it's hard to keep track now. And there was um, quite a bit of talk about. Washington Road in uptown and different ideas of what it might look like. It was an interesting exercise. Um, just a lot more talk about multimodal transportation and um, I am yeah, nothing. I, I don't think there was anything um, that we haven't already talked about in, in the 
here as far as complete streets and all that. They did ask for the board's ranking recently to us, so we we got that information to them for that group. So they are they're on the brain somewhere in there. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so uh, new business. Something we forgot to mention too, just briefly, the uh, pickleball courts are open now over at Williamsburg as well. Yeah, yeah. they're lit up. Before Six of them. Get off. Yeah, we, yeah, we were doing the punch list walkthrough and we got bumped off the courts yeah. by I users. I say 13 years in Mount Lebanon, I've heard more about that particular park. Really? Well, well, now the question there are various is: various people, Mario, oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear they're open now? There's like lots of people. Coming. So now the bears and coolers like yeah. staring at it. It was amazing. I mean, there was like a line of people as wow. we were unlocking the gates. Well, the question in my mind is: How long is it going to take until we start getting complaints about the pop, 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 yeah. pop, yeah. pop? Yeah, pop, yeah. Pop, all right, that's what we're doing. Not yet. Yeah. 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 But. There's an article in the current almanac. It just came yesterday. It references Mount Lebanon and, and Meadowbrook. Uh, really? Excellent. Yeah. Ah. Uh, space. Fire. You can hear it. Something like 5% of all emergency room visits in the United States don't really indicate. Yeah. 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 People yeah. playing pickleball and hurting yourself. Over in St. Clair. Oh, man. Some sangry amount. How do you hurt yourself, yourself playing pickleball? You get, you're 83 and you yeah. get yeah. 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 going and you okay. fall. Yeah. Break your wrist. Okay. <laughs> Hip replacements yeah. are going to increase. <laughs> the uh, the Williamsburg uh, stream that had been blocked up. The guys uh, got that pipe going again. I forgot to mention that real quick. And installed a new structure, a new head wall. Uh, restored the area with like uh, a nice fescue mix that rolls over. It looks pretty cool if you go along that bridge. It looks nothing like what it used to. The creek's flowing again underground, and then daylight's back at that that last shard. So. Just a little minor thing, but it was a pretty extensive repair. I wanted to ask you, was there was there vandalism at uh, at the soccer just field? One. So you're referring to the nice tight circle. That yeah, it was driven. Right. Yeah, yeah. we three seven that time. Still one. Over the top zone, we've seen it. So, mm -hmm. does does that, that, is it related happens. to keeping the gate locked or? Uh, yeah, there's there's different groups. There's rec programs that go down there to drop off equipment, move goals, repaint lines. Um, so only them and us and the Porter John guy have a key. So uh, nobody left it open. Speaking of that Porter John guy, uh, twice in the last month, he sped down that road through Bird Park, almost took me out. And then I noticed when I was, I don't know if it's always the same driver. It is. In, okay. In the, uh, I dropped my kids off at um, the baseball camp. This was three weeks ago. And he, there were, you know, 30 kids going between the batting cages and the field. I mean, it was like scary how fast he came in. I was in my car. It was really awful. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, new business. A quick thing, which is this is an update on the, Interpretive sign for Bird Park. The um, graphic artist we had working on it out of California as a professional artist um, just decided that her watercolor skills were not up to it because the Nature Conservancy was requesting a watercolor for the main scene. But we had, she did finalize the overall uh, graphic and our, we finalized the language. So it's really a matter of sharing it with you. And then we um, hired a local artist who's a resident young person um, and she's now doing a watercolor and these are her sketches um, which are going to be um, simplified structures will be kind of in the way in the background they'll pass these around so you can take a look so that will be inserted in the green space here and it will be an 18 by 24 sign on a single post and um, again, this is in the restoration area, uh, the riparian area. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And where is this going? This is supposed to go, if you look at that, um, I can show you on the map here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Don't put it down. It could be a bridge. Oh, uh, actually, it looks like it, Bingo. it will be in, <laughs> in around C12. Wait, is that right? Yeah. So it's at the end of Youngwood. It'll be off the path. 
Um, it'll be likely be the post and the actual base will likely be park service green, actual park service green or brown. Uh, so, you know, we want it to not be standing out. Um, I guess we'll be close to this size. And uh, right now we're debating between having a framed insert so it can be updated and replaced or um, uh, they can do an acrylic print that goes onto the surface and non-reflective and uh, is there. So um, from the start, I mean, we said we don't want a lot of signs around, but this is particular area and it's um, really close to the entrance of that main pathway that you mentioned does cut through uh, private land but connects Markham to this so it's a good educational opportunity for the students there and we try to keep text to a minimum uh, while increasing the interpretive aspect of it the you know stormwater it's restoration and it's uh, Understanding biodiversity. When there's a major donor, because in the Columbia Water or some Columbia, they donate like sixteen thousand for it. Yeah, Pennsylvania American Water. Yeah, how much was that? Oh, for the for the overall restoration. So you put a little note like, you know, you know, supported by. I think it's on here. Yeah, funded by American Water Foundation. And I think public works is mentioned there too. Yeah, it's, it was, that was the only other thing I was going to say. I know that I'm going to complain, but you know, I seeing a municipal logo or something there. Yeah, should, should be Peter, in the center section, there will be a picture or something. That's why we're showing it right now to yeah. catch it before we get some impression of like what goes in the middle is going to be some sort of artistic impression, like that, a watercolor. Cool. Um, that would be nice. That'll look great. Yeah. And so, it, you know, the art, we just gave some feedback to the artists. And one of the things, we gave a species list so that all the species are accurate, but we said we don't really want everything on this list in there. We want it simplified. It should be artistic, impressionistic, but still give a sense of what it will look like when it's restored. Um, and so that's the idea. And then these are kind of, these are little uh, almost magnifiers. So there, as you can see on that watercolor, there'll be like a log, you know, there'll be a, tr a bird on a tree and things like that. So with the streams prominent in the section. Great, that's gonna be yeah, beautiful. Really nice, yeah. I have a comment about the, the wording. Um, if this is still up for potential change, if uh, what evidence of a healthy ecosystem can you see? If I only read the first four words, and then I walk away. I see invasive plants and, or pets and plants, and then I leave. So I would just recommend maybe switching around the sentence, mm -hmm. if possible, yeah. um, to um, or maybe even switching the sentences around, just talking about how this area has been. Or let's see, over time, this restored riparian area. So go positive first, and then um, and then talk about what was there. Uh. I'll talk with you after. Yes, that I'm, sounds I'm good. not sure I understand okay. it. Okay. But we did rearrange this. Actually, originally the the little paragraph was first, and then the question was last. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would benefit to have the question first, because um, I think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. is to have, rather than saying stuff, is to have people look first and grab sure. stuff and yeah. then put it in context. But right. I'm open to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can chat after. Okay. Yep. So you reminded me, Peter, that Eagle Scout candidate, uh, a rule sent that he completed his project last weekend. Uh, thanks for the gravel pump boards. And we did 400 feet of trail through the restoration area. They had lots of volunteers, great day. They installed five bird boxes. So it'll be interesting to see birds take residence in these boxes over time. So it's good. A lot of oh, wow. boxes are something that they do big. One of them, one or two of them. Really big. Yeah. What grid box was there? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Kidding. Yeah. So we have no idea box. Um, <laughs> all right. Thanks, Peter. Um, and then did you want to talk about uh, particles? Are you not doing that? 
Oh, yes. Um, also under new business, uh, we haven't done the park visits round. We've been doing the maintenance updates and questions. Uh, I feel like Bird, Williamsburg, it's gone a lot of Bradford, we've had, we've been there. And it's it's parks uh, such as Hoodridge, um, Highland Terrace, the parks that we don't go to as often. Um, shall we just quickly look for volunteers to visit those parks? Um, what we all do? Quite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not like a group field trip. It's an individual effort. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and to bless everyone. Too. I was going to say, I, 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 I'm in. Man. You want to provide I'm, cookies and I'll bring the cookies. We'll smell them together. <laughs> I don't know. Take a beer. <laughs> so to to so the question of all versus one assign, my challenge is time management. It just yeah. takes a lot to uh, commit to go to uh, all. One thought if, if we are doing a main park study, would it make sense to zone off main park and have each of us take a zone? Really look at our make suggestions. That's uh, that was part of the challenge with main park. It's so big. It's so we big. zoned it for like three areas. We could, I don't know if it'd be helpful for what even or the consultants are doing. Because they're working off of these spreadsheets at like a link and the other um, part of the point. You know, we went through and we, these are three, four years old at this point. Phil's fixed a lot of them. They'll, they'll have your meetings like, also look yeah. at from past this past assessment. The one before that, so that we're doing data dump right now on them. So we did it last year. They're getting that stuff. Oh, did we do main park last year? I, I believe so. Relatively recent. I thought. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I mean, okay. What are the What are the ones you see as? You had a list. Yeah. Yeah. So. The ones that we don't get to very often are Church Place, Island Terrace, Woodridge. We did church place last year. Usually it's the ones we didn't do last year. Okay. We did like half last year. And then we do the other half. Uh, would be good to take a look at pine cones. I know you spent a lot of time trying to just put some any next steps. Yeah. So um, sorry. There's been a lot of interest on the Sunset Hills uh neighborhood uh, social media page about the meadow and people wanting to replicate the meadow in their own private yards awesome. and so uh, the we i i was linked on there i was called out and i directed them to marin and marianne uh and also the seed list so people have there's a lot of fuss about the meadow yeah, this year so trees look healthy too I was there recently, so. So I will come back via email on this one because I'm not, <laughs> clearly I'm not ready. I got the feedback, main park, everybody take a section. Option. Other parks, let me look and see what we covered last year. Yeah, we have a look at church place. Okay. okay. I would find Cone would be good. Um, so. Visiting Pine could be great. Um, so let me let me come back to you. No, so what do you think? Spend much time. is always fun. <laughs> yeah. I'd be happy to do at least a couple. I I vowed when I got appointed in April I'd do them all, and it's now August first, and I haven't got a little part. Well, if, any, if anybody's doing them, I would love to participate. So if you're going, let me know. Um, I if I can. Um, clarification. Um, this came up last year too. Is that we when we do these, it's kind of to point out things that are in imminent need for yeah, fill. Yeah. Um, it's not so much like a planning thing, although we we do deal with that because that could, I mean, just in terms of the meeting time and everything, it it seems like it it opens up things that we're discussing in other contexts. So uh, if I understand correctly, and Richard, you have more history than me, but the it's it's more or less putting together a list of items that need attention, like right. and, and it causes the members to get familiar with all the parts. That too, yeah. So so otherwise we know our little you know, the original concept was every you know ward member of the park. So you knew your wards parks. This is right. great me. And so part of the parks tour was to force you to get out of your ward 
and, and do a rotation when you get to every park in the system and you get familiar with it, what you because you only have a three year, possibly a three year term. Yeah. It's not just things that need attention, but it could be improvement too. But things like Ganya mentioning the cannon and thistle coming up, you know, so those are the kinds well, of Well, it was the context of the 2003 master plan. So that was like a. Right. Oh, that was we had already done parkers. So it was like, okay, and it was constantly referring back to what's open on the master plan. And by about 15 or 16, most of that master plan was done. Yeah. And so I, I just. And I just add support for the idea of continuing the tradition of doing that. I, I, for the reason of keeping us and individually familiar with each of the parks is a reason enough to um, be doing that regularly. Um, I'm wondering if we want to, I, I do, I agree with getting to know the parks and I think it's important that we all get to know the parks, but I'm wondering if maybe we want to have um, almost like stewards of each park. So, so each member would have how many of us are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many parks do we have on um, on our list? So maybe each person has two parks in every I don't know, six months. Every month for those six months or every other month for those six months, you go to those two parks and you're kind of following along with the maintenance of that park. And then six months later, you move to another one. It would have to be a rotating schedule. But the board realignment that we all have here. Right. Good point. Good point. Yeah, that's coming. That's coming soon. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't go there. Yeah. Still do the same. Yeah. Right. It'll be in a different. Right. Okay. So let, let me come back to you all via email uh, on this. The, does anyone else have any other new business they want to use? Um, so I cover it next week. Uh, I did through contacts get a hold of uh, people at PADCNR and they explained to me the whole Project 70 land concept that uh, we pretty similar to what the city attorney is, but I, I could talk about it you know, maybe next time and just give an overview. And it's not so much about how you use the land, but that it gets to maintain control by the city and it's, and it's always a shared use no matter what you do. So a little, little anecdote, like we were talking about the parking spaces along Youngwood. When those parking spaces, if they come across into Project 70 land, it basically turns them into a public parking lot. <laughs> because then anything that uses that land has to be open to all Pennsylvania citizens. So, so if the city, for example, says yeah, that, 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 that that parking pad goes six inches of PADSNR, if it goes six over inches over the property boundary, that homeowner can no longer have exclusive use of that pad it has to become part it becomes like effectively a park parking that park entire park. parking spot that, not, not just, just six, 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 no, the entire parking wow. spot so it becomes a and they said they've had examples of a homeowner goes and builds a nice patio and like a, 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 a fire pit and things in a project 70 and the dnr just gives them notice thank you for the donation that's now a public facility and we really appreciate <laughs> <your> <laughs> Yeah, so because <laughs> there you have to, everything has to be. And the one point they made, like, and, I, and I'll, then I'll shut up. It's a, a challenge on a turfed field is you have to have let it be accessible to all parties at the same fee rate. So you can't give your own teams preference. You can give them schedule preference, like if the rec director, sure. but they they have to be charged. Even practices have to be charged the same rate per hour for the field use as any other party. We can't say, well, you're not from Mount Lebanon. We won't let you run field time. Mm -hmm. So they said they've seen facilities on Project 70 land be problematic just because of the requirement to make them open public use. And you have to post, like they said, technically even soccer field now, we're supposed to have a sign that says, if you want to reserve this field, please contact so-and-so at the city mm -hmm. and such and such. Um, things like that. So it's more about creating facilities for companies, but I'll do it somewhere later. But the other positive thing is they, they wanted to talk to somebody, they were asking, why aren't we applying for more grants? And so they were, uh, they, they said they didn't see many grants from us and they wanted to. But the feeling was that. I, so I just got me and said, hold the charge. Or I'll tell you. Yeah. Phil wants lots of money. I said, I'll give you Phil's contact and he'll ask you that. But one specific yeah. thing, this is the public walkways. Yeah. When we were talking, I commented that Markham is on the other side of the park. And then like 
the elementary kids from Mayfair, you know, stuff walk through that. That's essentially what they asked about when they passed. They said, well, that's in essence the school path zone. And they lit up and they go, oh, we have all sorts of grants for, for if you have a, if you actually have a school walkway going through a, you know, like a park area, we have specific grants to, you know, make those nicer trail work. So they wanted, they said, you know, there's, there's, they said they wanted to talk to somebody about the grant opportunities and what PCPA DCNR has right now. Because so they said evidently project 70 parcels get preferential treatment on grants. Oh, wow. Or so I think that's what they were indicating. Anyway, so I'm gonna. I said I'd send them the Phil. I believe that's right. I said send. I sent him Phil's email address and the name, the whatever the regional person wanted to introduce herself to talk about possible grants. Unless you want me, I can send you. I can copy you the other new business <laughs> items. I made some notes on here about the municipal website relevant. The parks, uh, you can look at those or just have a look at the website and see what comments you have. Uh, email me, I'll compile a list. It may be that they're just not done with uh, these pages yet, but I'm happy to compile a list of feedback about the content on the municipal website. There are still solution things. I mean, yeah, there, there were, you know, it's, it's in full use, but we're finding things to. I mean, we, we need to we could look at them to call them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But you can you can send them to me, and we can right. collapse them all right together. Yeah, uh, it's a live site, but it's a living site now. It's right. A, it's it's a done. very. Um, uh, they they switched to WordPress. Um, you know, as from a old kind of structured framework site. Um, so we have as much flexibility as we need. So now it's just really just a question of design and content. So yeah, feedback. Um, always is a good thing. Uh, seasonal and special items. We had our employee designations update today. Uh, year management, if, if the report from the contractor is available, I have time to analyze it. Um, we'll talk about year management next week. Uh, someone has a, something else they think would be higher priority. Uh, commission meeting message on the 12th, Tom and I went and presented the, the table that you see below there. Uh, I talked about number three, Tom talked about number one, and you know the thinking being Meadowcroft is probably a done deal. So we hit the top three. Uh, if anybody would like to, to go at commission again, um, I'm happy to join them for any of the other items. Uh, do, um, do we have any uh, other ideas for August commission meetings or topics that we would want to bring up with them or, and or volunteers? I, I would just offer that there's probably going to be lots of public comment over trash. So if you're going to do public comment, <laughs> be ready to sit and, and uh, okay. Enjoyed all the content. Until after that vote. <laughs> when is the vote? Uh, next, uh, next Tuesday. Week. Next, yeah, next Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> I can skip that meeting. <laughs> yeah, commission meetings are. That guy looks like a business friend. Yes, they are. It's going to be a good day <laughs> Yes, they can be. I usually enjoy them when they're got other people that I'm sitting at. All <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I know. Talk about anything else. Yeah. Uh, put anything else out there. Yeah. 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 Thanks. I think you're going to tell me that 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 you're going to t